since well before Victor Hugo looked up at Notre Dame and thought, huh, what if a hunchback lived in there? Authors have been inspired by Paris. The Storytime in Paris podcast will help keep this tradition alive with interviews and readings from your favorite contemporary authors with a French connection. Every episode features five questions asked by you, our author's biggest fans, and answered live on air. Then our authors will treat us to a reading of an excerpt from their book. Who knows? Maybe you'll even be inspired to write your own great French novel. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. My guest this week is Stephen Clark, author of at least 18 books. His first published novel, A Year in the Merd, was met with international acclaim. It was nominated for the British Book Award for Best Newcomer and has found its way into many an expat's library, including my own. Since then, Stephen has written a total of six books in the Merd series, two additional works of fiction, and nine nonfiction books. He's written two stage shows. His book, A Thousand Years of Annoying the French, inspired a permanent museum collection here in France, which he curated. And he helped co-write the book of another former Storytime in Paris author, Dion Forrest. Stephen has sold more than 2.5 million books worldwide. Stephen's latest novel, The Spy Who Inspired Me, is his first foray into a new-to-him genre, historical fiction. Self-described as a sort of James Bondian spoof, The Spy Who Inspired Me features charming and debonair Ian Lemming, or should I say features Ian Lemming who thinks he's charming and debonair, and the stoic, incredibly capable secret agent Margot as they fight to complete their mission in Nazi-occupied France during World War II. Please allow me to introduce Stephen Clark, author of The Spy Who Inspired Me. Good morning, Stephen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Morning. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your new book? Uh, yes, sure. Um, so I'm Stephen Clark, uh, English writer, living in Paris. I mean, I've lived here for more than 20 years now. Um, and the other day I did a radio interview for English radio and they were saying, um, oh, isn't it weird you've got a French accent when you speak English, which I can't <laughs> hear, but maybe I have sometimes, you know. Um, anyway, so I'm I'm sort of... These days, I suppose I'm more an English Parisian rather than um, an Englishman living in France. Anyway, I'm very Parisian. Um, and my new, my latest book uh, is called The Spy Who Inspired Me. And as its title suggests, it's a kind of James Bond spoof, although the, the, the word James Bond is never mentioned in the novel, uh, partly for legal reasons, because, you know, you can't do that sort of thing. And it's, um, it's kind of mischievous idea um, I had that, um, you know, James Bond, Ian Fleming, the, the creative James Bond, was notoriously macho, sexist. He was pretty, I mean, his books come across these days as pretty racist as well and everything ist. And he, and so I wrote one, I've written this one where you imagine Ian Fleming, as he's called, this uh, armchair naval commander, uh, during the Second World War, which Ian Fleming was, um, getting stranded on a Normandy beach with a tough woman who in a Bond film would be a Bond girl, you know, oh, help me, James, you know, sort of stuff. Whereas that she turns out to be the tough spy. And he's the one during the novel who, like, he, he sulks because he hasn't, hasn't brought enough cigarettes with him and he hasn't got a razor and hasn't got clean clothes. And she's saying to him, you know, this is occupied France, you know, this is not how we do things here. So he starts imagining champagne and tuxedos and a male secret agent who, who lords it over women. You know, you can, you kind of feel James Bond being created in his head. Uh, and it takes place in occupied France in 1944. The spy who inspired me. So it's a kind of spy spoof, but it's, I mean, it's not as spoof as Austin Powers. It's kind of um, much more, it's like a historical novel with, with comedy bits in it. That's exactly, I was describing it to my mother, and that's exactly what I said. I said, it's a spoof. She said, like, Austin Powers, and I said, no, not that far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, not at all that far. No, I mean, I've even tried to kind of, in some ways, imitate 1940s James Bond-style language in the narration and everything, and, it, you know, and all the, all the, unlike Austin Powers, all the kind of period details are, are correct. You know, I've researched cars and clothes and food and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Can you tell us uh, what your connection, I know you've been here for 20 years, so what is your yeah. connection to France? What brought you here and why did you stay? What brought me here was uh, work or the relative 
uh, lack of it, which uh, I mean, I, was, I had a very stressful job in the UK working for a company that was um, a subsidy of Rupert Murdoch's media empire, uh, which means that meant that the budgets was like totally out of control, our control. So that every time Rupert Murdoch wanted to take a penny off the sun or sky news or whatever, you know, our area of the company, which was which was dictionaries, bilingual dictionaries, you know, uh, nothing to do with the sun. We, you know, suddenly I was being told, don't pay any of your translators for the next month, stuff like that, you know, it's getting very stressful. Um, so I, I looked around for a job and I found one in France working on an English language magazine with um, 35 hours a week, masses and masses of holiday. I couldn't believe it. And uh, it sounded to me as if there was going to be a lot less stress because I saw when I went for my interview that the, the magazine editor had um, champagne in her office fridge. And I thought, right, this is the kind of company I'd like to work for. You know, So, um, so I came to France and, and, and never left. Fabulous. Yeah, I think champagne would tempt me too. Yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. Every every Friday, she used to get five o'clock on a Friday. No, it must have been earlier because we didn't work till five o'clock on Fridays. But uh, every Friday, she'd get out of the bottle, and the, you know the team would would have champagne, you know, to start the weekend. Incredible. Very civilized. Yeah. So I've compiled five questions from your fans and followers. The first one is this: So you've written, I think, eighteen books by my count. Depends how you count. Uh, but kind of that kind of number, yeah. Yeah, something like that. I w- I thought it was fourteen, but then I was looking at the in the beginning of the spy who inspired me and counted, and then I think there's mm-hmm. like seventeen or eighteen. Right. Yeah. All of these books, as far as I can tell, have a connection to France. Um, not all of them, no. Um, most of them, yeah. I mean, I've, there are two novels. Um, one of which is called A Brief History of the Future, which is set in Bournemouth, where I grew up, and another one called. Death Goes Viral, which strangely enough is about a pandemic, but I wrote it way before the pandemic, um, and there's sort of masks in it and everything, and who's masked and who's not is a oh, key wow. thing. Um, Death Goes Viral, that that is also set in uh, Bournemouth as well. Okay. But the other rest are all, yeah, the rest is all Anglo-France, because, you know, you should always write about what you know about, and obviously what I know about is being English in France and sort of, and I've researched Anglo-French history for a thousand years of knowing the French and all that sort of stuff. So my question is, what do you think it is about France and the French that makes them such a source of inspiration and, dare I say, ridicule for you? Um, firstly, they're available. Um, you know, <laughs> they're, they're not far away. No, I think, I mean, seriously, it's true that, you know, neighbours always have the closest relationship because you can, like, see and hear everything your neighbour's doing and weirdly, you know, if, even if your neighbor's happy and is having a party, it could annoy you because they're making too much noise, you know. So neighbors always, are, they're there. And the weird thing, I think, about France and the UK is that although we're neighbors, we have just a very slim strip of sea between us, and you know, which is now breached by the tunnel. We, we're completely opposite in so many ways, you know. It's almost as if, you know, like two teams sat down centuries ago and said, okay, you're the Brits, you're the, you're the French. Okay, how are you going to do this? Okay, we'll do it this way. Okay, we'll do it the opposite way. Almost everything is the opposite. So culture clash, you know, when if you're a Brit arriving in France, uh, as I was, and later the hero of my mad novels, Paul West, was, and he couldn't, I could speak French when I got here. He couldn't. So he just doesn't understand anything. He goes into a big company, doesn't understand how it works. Doesn't he understands the words, but he doesn't understand why people would say these kind of things. You know, the culture clash is just enormous. So, especially when you've lived here and you see the details of it, you know, which is what I try to get in my books, so like the real detail of it, not not sort of oh god, they all eat garlic, you know, not you know nonsense like that. Like real details about everyday life and the way companies work and people, the way people think, you know, because I think partly like a Parisian now obviously, because I am Parisian. So, you know, show me a queue and I will push to the front of it. I'm Parisian, you know, and I've got all these fantastic Parisian techniques for doing so, uh, which I sell online um, very, <laughs> to uh, non-Parisians. You know, so, yeah, it's, it's we're, we're, you know, it's so near and yet so far. Ridicule is a bit strong, I think. I don't, I don't ridicule the French because, you know, the, loads of my books are translated into French and they buy them. And I get invited onto French TV and radio absolutely all the time to, 
to talk about, you know, what do the Brits, Brits think of this happening in France, you know. So it really cool. no, it's, I think it's more a case of the love that dare not speak its name. You know, we kind of, deep down, we actually love each other and we, we like the opposite things about each other. You know, we're, the, the, we Brits, we think the French are also incredibly sophisticated and they know everything about wine and food and everything, which they don't, you know, loads of them don't. Um, but that's what we think. And they, they all think if they get on the Eurostar and come to London, they think they're going to be, everyone's going to be driving around in a Mini or an E-type Jag, you know, and they'll, they'll bump into Paul McCartney you know, or a punk. You know, that deep down, we kind of think, we think that, you know, and we fantasize about it. So it's kind of, uh, I tease them um, about being themselves and they, they actually enjoy it. And they, they, what they most often say to me is, oh God, yeah, you're right. Prisons are so like that, meaning all the Prisons except moi, you know. So, um, yeah, that's a very long answer to your question. No, I, I think you're right. I think that they do appreciate a gentle teasing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They love it because partly because you're paying them attention. You're saying, oh, you're so important. That I've written books about you. And they think, oh, wow, yeah, that, yeah, he's right. You know, yeah, we are important. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good perspective. So you've written a lot of fiction and you've written historical nonfiction. But The Spy Who Inspired Me is the first time that you've combined the two into historical fiction. Yeah. So what finally made you take the leap into this new genre? Well, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about uh, writing something about the occupation, which is uh, the Nazi occupation, which is a terribly complex time for the French. It's, some of them are still hung up about it now. It still gets mentioned absolutely all the time. You know, when during the, the first lockdown, the bars were closed and um, some bars were opening illegally and having little parties and stuff. And whenever the police turned up, you, you know, on social media, you'd, you'd see people saying, oh, my God, it's just like 1940, you know, the Gestapo. And I was thinking, no, it's not at all like 1940, because the Gestapo, when they turned up, they arrested you, tortured you, either shot you or sent you to a concentration camp. Whereas the, the French police were just saying, um, could you please go home now? You know, <laughs> this may not be a good idea for health reasons, so go home. It's not like 1940 at all, but the, the instinctive reaction there amongst some French people, not all of them, is, oh my God, it's 1940 again. So occupation is very much in people's minds. And I wanted to write something about it, except I didn't, didn't want to write a sort of a complete book about the occupation because it's kind of a painful subject. There's not much to laugh about. And I always try and, you know, inject humor to it. So I thought it'd be much more fun to do do a kind of poor West a year in the mayor take on it almost by having this kind of Englishman arrive in occupied France and he doesn't want to be there. Um, so you get the whole culture clash, fish out of water thing happening again. He he likes France. He loves France, you know, French champagne and everything. But um, he, he doesn't feel you know, very comfortable there. And so I, it, the historical novel gave me a chance to put in a real historical background and then have sort of um, Anglo-French fun on top of it. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. That leads me very easily to my next question. The novel is set during the Nazi occupation in France during World War II, but the tone of the book, even though it's this thriller adventure, is playful and fun. And your main character, Ian Lemming, is flirting and making jokes, even in these nail-biting situations. So how were you able to strike the balance between the personality of Ian Lemming with the fraught historical background? Hmm. Yeah, it is a very delicate balance. And uh, the thing is, I think, in you know, in life as in fiction, is sometimes you have to um, realize that things are serious and, you know, there's no time for joking anymore. I get into lots of trouble in, in real life making jokes in a, at inappropriate times, not inappropriate jokes, you know, where someone says something to me and I answer them in a stupid way and they're thinking, is he joking or not? And if he is joking, why is he joking? You know, um, silly example. Oh, yes, I was at this sort of posh cocktail party in in Paris, you know. And this wo I said to this woman, you know, what do you do, you know, as they do? And she said, je travaille dans le cinéma, which sounded to me very pretentious. I work in cinema. So I said to her, oh, yes, which one? I live quite near the, you know, this <laughs> cinema. And she said to me, she looked at me for a second, she said, no, I'm a producer. And I, you know, 
she didn't laugh or anything like that. She just didn't know whether I was joking. Is this Englishman joking with me? If so, why? Why is he making fun of me? He doesn't even know, you know. So I have that problem uh, in real life. Well, not a problem, but I have that tool in, you know, in real life. Because if you're a Brit, you can get away with it because they think, oh, he's a stupid Brit, you know. So it's the same in fiction where in the book, the tone is kind of, it's a bit of a sort of an adventure novel. But sometimes things get really, really serious, you know, and and, and Ian Lemming and uh, his uh, sidekick, Margot Lind, they kind of realize it and, and you know, the, the joking stops. They have a little banter going because he's trying to flirt with her, but she's a very serious spy and she has no time for this stuff, you know. So she just sort of bats it all away. But, um, you know, at one point in, in the novel, he's kind of whinging about, you know, it's cold and I'm, you know, where am I going to get a bath? And I want to go home sort of thing. And she and she so just says to him, okay, look, you know, seriously, either I leave you here and get on with my mission, okay, or I just shoot you now because if the Gestapo pick you up, you're going to talk to them, you know, going to tell them everything in five minutes. No, you know, probably, no, I can't leave you here. Either you come with me or I shoot you. And he realizes she's deadly serious. This is a serious moment. So it's kind of, a lesson, not a lesson exactly, but it, it, it's, it's kind of saying to people, okay, here we can joke, here we can't joke. And I presume in, you know, in real life wartime, you know, two people could be joking and then suddenly a bomb, bombs start falling, the joking stops, you have to react. And that's what happens in, in, the, in the book as well, where they can have a little banter, but then sometimes they just they have to shut up because there's a, a soldier going past or life gets very serious sometimes. They do also seem to have a really strong moral line where, whereas you can maybe joke about the, the Nazis, you can't joke about being a Nazi. Yeah, I, I mean, I have that, um, the, the French sometimes, I think, they, they do cross the line occasionally uh, trying to shock with their humour. And I, th- I honestly think there are some things you can't joke about, you know, because if you're going to hurt someone or if it sounds hateful or whatever. So I try to be very careful with that. Yeah, you can't joke about being a Nazi. Uh, you can make jokes against the Nazis, obviously. But um, so, yeah, there are there are times when, you know, let's get serious and, and this is a serious problem. Um, so in the book, there are sort of moments of lighthearted banter and there are like moments of sort of very serious action where they you honestly feel one of them might get killed or captured or whatever, you know. So, yeah, the occupation was a terrible time for that, I should imagine, because daily life was going on. You know, lo- most of the French people, most French people sort of just got on with daily life. And they were just so happened that there were people in Nazi uniforms wandering about, you know, and they kept out of their way. But um, some of them were resisting and risking their lives just by owning a radio. You know, that's what happens in the um, in the book. A radio operator has disappeared because um, during the, the war, one of the most dangerous jobs people had and most of these jobs were done by women was they were sent into occupied France to operate the radio for a resistance network and the Nazis had already developed technology for homing in on these radios and they would then go they would not only take the radio and and the person operating it they would also arrest everyone in the building and send them off to a camp so it was an incredibly dangerous thing to do and it was done by women and part of the story is you know surely uh, Ian Lemming and Ian Fleming should have known this, whereas, you know, he's being very flirtatious with this woman, whereas she has a deadly serious, you know, mission, uh, which is to investigate the disappearance of these, um, of this resistance network. I want to ask you about the research that you did for this book. Mm -hmm. Did you do much firsthand research? Did you go and explore the different places that you mentioned? Yeah, well, I bought a time machine on uh, Amazon, you know. (laughs) Perfect. Yeah, yeah, you know, 99 euros, 99. Um, took a long time to arrive because it was during lockdown. So, you know, I think it was stuck in the Suez Canal. No, I mean, uh, yeah, yes, obviously, I always do a lot of research for um, my historical, not uh, my historical, um, my history books, I should say. And um, going back into archives, I find is the best. Rather than reading a book like What Went On in Occupied France, I go back to newspapers, posters, photos, films. I mean, I I did study a lot of photos and films of the time, newsreels and stuff, to see what people were wearing. Uh, Even, you know, the the streets of Paris would have looked sort of similar, but but then, you know, at crossroads, you'd have these poles with loads of 
German signs in Gothic script saying this way to the Soldatenheim and, you know, stuff like that. So you'd have sort of the whole Nazi regalia would be stamped onto places, flags outside buildings, you know, um, hotels requisitions, cafes requisitions. So I wanted to know, yes, in, in sort of real detail, not only what went on, but what things looked like. And so I did a lot of research. And the idea is, like in the history books and in, in, in the novel, is kind of, um, not to slap people around the face with this stuff, but it just becomes the natural background to everything. So this where you're, you know, operating becomes a, just a credible background. Like in, in a film, you know, you've got to avoid anachronism as much as you can, or totally if you can, and just make it a credible background. So yeah, yeah, I always do a lot of uh, background research. I found it very easy to picture when you were talking about everything. It's very visual. Yeah, well, I always do. I mean, I do that. Was, I can quite honestly say that whenever I write something, I picture it and hear it in my head like a film. And then I just put it down on the page. I can, I can you know, my, my characters, I had a dream. I won't describe all my dreams, but I had a dream the other night where I, it was weird. I was in, um, I was in a dream with uh, a real person. And then Jake, one of the characters from my, my mad novels, he was there and he was real in the dream. You know, I can because I can I can quite honestly I can picture him. I know who I know what he looks like. You know, and so if, when I'm writing, everything for me is like that. I can see it, and I that's why I need to go to places. Yeah, long, I mean, in the novel, a lot of it happens in the north along the north coast of France, and I spent a lot of time there because I was working on um, a museum up there, the the Chateau de Ardelot, the Centre Culturel de l'Entente Cordiale, and so I spent a lot of time up there. So I, you know, I know that area. And obviously I went back and, and you know, even, you know, the, the house, there's a scene in a house in uh, Le Touquet in the garden. And, you know, I can I can show you the house if you want, where, where in the garden, where it happens, you know. I, I think all that sort of stuff, authenticity is really important, I think, in, in fiction, just as it is in a history book, you know, get your facts right. In fiction, get your, also get your facts right, you know, and then make up the rest. The book is told third person, but it's from Lemming's perspective. And you've paired him with this very strong female spy. Can you talk a little bit about why you decided to pair up Lemming and Margot throughout this adventure? Yeah, the, the third person um, narrative it is, well, it's from Lemming's point of view, is the kind of joke in a way, because it's that's where the Bond spoof comes in, because I've tried to, uh, in some ways, imitate Ian Fleming's 1940s 50s language and he you know his novels are told through the eyes of bond the difference here is that yeah he's paired with this um tough woman but and then then that also becomes part of the joke because lemming as we see him he sometimes he doesn't understand you know he has his suspicions about her she there's something not quite right about it she's not one of these simple bond girls where okay you know she's she's this woman who needs rescuing or whatever you know they in in the real bond books and films there's almost no reliable totally reliable women until very recently you know the the moral of you know ian fleming's work seems to be you know women are going to let you down and in the first bond book casino royale james bond actually says he doesn't like working with women because it just it's too complicated you know he just says sort of love and sex get in the way because they all fall in love with him and he knows it you know he's so handsome and everything and um so the third person narrative from his point of view allows sort of she's margot is out there operating and doing things and he doesn't always understand what she's doing whereas it becomes increasingly clear that she knows exactly what she's doing and he is the one hampering her and he gradually comes to understand her and only like in the last couple of pages does he think all oh, right and now you know yes she's she is a completely independent woman making her own decisions and i don't you know she's rescuing me i'm not rescuing her sort of thing you know so the the third person from his point of view is a kind of literary exercise except it's not supposed to, you know you know again i'm not slapping people's face slapping people around the face with this it's just the novel is told from his point of view because it allow almost it allows margot to keep sort of secrecy you know who is she wow she can do that he he realizes he comes to respect her more and more because she's revealing herself to him because before the mission he doesn't really know her he thinks they met when he picked her up in the street, but he gradually realizes that no, she picked him up. He invited her to a restaurant. No, hang on. She suggested the restaurant. You know, he comes to realize all this stuff about her because she's um, very clever at hiding things. Yeah, absolutely. 
We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. I think you're going to read us a clip from your, an excerpt from your book. I am, yes. Is there anything that we need to know contextually? Yeah, yeah. This is from right near the start of the um, novel. It starts uh, in a restaurant, in this restaurant where, um, as well, in the excerpt, he, he mentions it. Um, it's a French restaurant in the centre of London. Um, so they've just sat down and um, Lemming is kind of turning on the charm and showing he knows all about food and how to, how to order in French and all that stuff. And he's putting on a big act. And uh, you, here you can see some of it you see here from Margot's point of view. And, you know, she's sort of sizing him up. But then again, it becomes immediately clear that he doesn't know her because he's putting on his act. But um, she's not maybe the woman he thinks she is. And, and she's not just impressed by all this stuff. Uh, there's something else going on. Um, right. Okay. So they, uh, he orders a bottle. He, he sort of makes a big show of ordering this wine, uh, which has her name, uh, Chateau Margot. And, um, and then the, the, uh, the wine waiter pretends to be very impressed by all this. So they're in the restaurant. Left alone, Lemming and Margot clinked glasses and drank champagne. What a simply perfect place, she said. And how clever of you to know about it. Lemming bowed modestly though he was not sure that he had been the one to suggest dining here. When he invited her to dinner, hadn't she mentioned that she would love to try that French place near the Mall? Yes, he was certain that the idea came from her. Almost so. No matter, he always enjoyed flattery of his male ego, however insincere or undeserved it was. He put down his glass and lit another cigarette. Margot thought he smoked far too much, probably a sign that he was easily bored. Not with her, she hoped. Not yet, anyway. The best French restaurants aren't here just to fill you with enough vitamins to keep your body functioning for the next few hours, he lectured her. They exist to flatter you. You, yes, toi, you have shown sheer genius in coming chez nous and in choosing these dishes. And that wine you selected? Brilliant. No one in the history of French cuisine has ever chosen such a perfect wine to accompany their food. This is why we, les garçons, will now serve everything with such sweeping, dramatic gestures. He put on a French accent. It is because you have inspired us, monsieur. We feel like singing and dancing for joy. It is so rare that we are lucky enough to be in the presence of such intellect, such effortless good taste, such class. Margot laughed, as she was meant to. She suspected it might be one of the dashing commander's set pieces, but she had to concede that there was something self-mocking about him that made you want to forgive his excess of swagger. Last time I was in, I was in Paris... The waiters at the Café de Flore made me feel an awful fool, Margot said. Lemming raised an eyebrow, as if he had decided that previous trips to Paris boded well for her lack of morals. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, he said. But, you know, these flattering restaurants are not to be confused with the traditional brasseries, <coughs> excuse me, where the waiters can make you feel like a baboon fresh from the jungle for not knowing the difference between creme brulee and creme caramel. I'll wager you were only there for coffee. Nothing expensive. Am I right? Yes, and I probably don't look enough like a starving philosopher to get decent service at the floor. And by the way, what is the difference between creme brulee and creme caramel? Half a minute with a flame for her. Nothing more. Well, I'll be damned. Margot looked around the room to see what might have caused the sudden blasphemy. But the diners were still merrily chattering and consuming, all of them savouring these precious air raid free moments of relaxation. Lemming began to scribble with a gold-propelling pencil into a small spiral notepad. He held up his free hand as if to ward off any questions. So Margot simply sat back and watched, amused by the mysteriousness of it all. She could make out nothing of his upside-down scrawl except flamethrower, unless it was foam rubber or farm robber or something similar. Yes, it might work, he said to himself, as he stowed the book and pencil in his hip pocket. Is it something terribly, terribly secret, Margot asked, with what she hoped was the right amount of feminine reverence? Yes. Sorry, old girl, an idea to share with the Admiral. If I told you what it was, you'd have to kill me. Isn't it supposed to be the other way round? Aren't you meant to say, if I told you, I'd have to kill you? No, my dear, because if I told you, it would mean I'm a security risk, and the war effort would be better off without me. He looked deadly serious. It didn't suit him as well as levity. 
Their wine came, along with their hors d'oeuvre, and Lemming told the waiter to keep the rest of the bottle of Tétinger aside for later. Again, his every word was greeted with admiring nods, as if he was inventing a whole new science of food appreciation. Lemming joked about this again as he mixed the mustard sauce into his grated carrots, but then his mood darkened for a moment. You know, he said, I think I'll suggest that the Admiral takes a closer look at this place. All these men of military age out of uniform. And how did they get their hands on the Tétinger 39? Surely it wasn't, it wasn't ready for shipping until after the Nazis had invaded. It seems slightly ungrateful to enjoy all the trimmings of their hospitality and then report them to the authorities, Margot said. You're right, Slemming agreed. So we, before we report them, we must make absolutely certain we finish that bottle of Tétinger. They shared a laugh and Margot felt the rasp of Lemming's woollen trousers as they gripped her own bare calf, almost brutally. She restrained herself. Her, insta her instinctive reaction to such a sudden onslaught would have been to ram the champagne glass into his face, but she took a deep breath and smiled through the smoke of yet another of his pungent cigarettes. She wondered what to do when, inevitably, he tried to kiss her as soon as they stepped out of the restaurant and into the blackout. Fabulous. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, what's next for you? Well, can we expect a sequel to this novel? Um, I, I'm thinking about a sequel, but um, yeah, I haven't um, got that far with it yet. Uh, I've just written a new Mayard novel, uh, which I've given to my agent, and I'm sort of wondering what to do with that, uh, which it won't be out till next year. And um, I'm working on a, a TV idea as well. Uh, I just got uh, a grant from the French CNC, C uh, Centre National de Cinéma, to um, write a, a pilot for a comedy series, obviously Anglo-French sort of jokey series, you know. But, I mean, you can write a pilot, it doesn't mean it's going to get filmed. So, um, but at least um, I'm working with a French co-writer on that one. So um, we'll see what happens, you know. So I'm, you know, having a lot of fun. I mean, I, I do like The Spy Who Inspired Me, and I like the characters, and I like the way... They, they get on together, so they you know they could go on another mission. Although that's a bit of a spoiler, it, it suggests that maybe they survived this one. But you know, <laughs> find, you'll have to find out whether the, you know how they survived. Maybe maybe he lost his legs or something. You know, you'll have to find out. But um, yeah, I'm you know always thinking about these things. Very interesting. Uh, I'm excited about the TV pilot idea. Well, yeah. I mean, again, it might just be a pilot that crashes into the waves. If, you know, <laughs> that's not a bad metaphor. But um, uh, yeah, it, it could be a lot of fun if 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 we write it well enough <laughs> and find a producer. You know. Yeah. So, where can people find you if they want to keep up to date with your goings on? Where can they find me at the cafe on the corner usually? <laughs> Um, or uh, yes, I you know I'm on uh, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. I do do Instagram, but only sort of very sporadically. I mean, I'm not there kind of all the time. I only sort of put something up there if I think of something silly or pertinent to say. I don't sort of oh my god, you know, just finished a cup of tea. You know, last last thing I posted was uh, oh yeah, I went to the um, I keep forgetting the name of the exhibition at the Louis Vuitton the Russian Impressionist uh, collection at the Louis Vuitton uh, thing here. And I posted, uh, there's a fantastic painting by Van Gogh of uh, the sea, a seascape with a boat in it. And and just, you look at the waves and it's actually, there's actual waves of paint and, you know, that actually made by Van Gogh's hand like 130 years ago. And you can see where he splodged some of the, the lumps of paint onto the canvas, which, you know, I just find kind of, you, you know, you're almost there in with, Van Gogh, you know. Um, so when I see someone like that, I put it on Facebook. But I also sometimes say, "Hey, look out for my new novel." But but <laughs> uh, um, I'm not all that present. I would I would say I'm just, it's just you know a bunch of usually a bunch of sort of silly photos and comments. Okay, well I'll post all of your information so okay. if people want to periodically get some pearls of clarity from you, they can. Great. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, thanks for letting me talk about myself. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again to Stephen Clark for taking the time to speak with me. I really enjoyed our conversation. Please join me next week when I'll be sitting down with Linda Lappin to discuss her novel, Loving Modigliani. Check back next week to see if your questions have been answered and to hear a reading from her book. Don't forget to subscribe to Storytime in Paris on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever it is you get your podcasts, so you never miss an episode. You can find the full Storytime in Paris playlist on parisundergroundradio.com slash storytimeinparis. 
and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Paris Underground Radio. My name is Jennifer Garrity. Storytime in Paris is produced by me for the Paris Underground Radio Podcast Network. For more on this show and to discover more great podcasts, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thank you and happy listening.